Hello, everybody. I'm David Eulen. I'm the books editor at Alta, Mag at Alta Journal, and I want to welcome you to the third um, meeting of the California Book Club. It's been a long year and a hard one, and I can't think of any better way to send it out than um, to sit and, and listen to a discussion um, of literature. Tonight's book is Walter Mosley's 1990 novel, Devil in a Blue Dress, which introduced the character of E.Z. Rollins and in many ways changed the way mysteries and, and crime fiction were, uh, were written in the United States. Um, I want to uh, open with a few sort of general notes. I want to um, tell you a little bit about Alta and the California Book Club, if you're not already familiar. Alta Journal is a quarterly journal um, published uh, in San Francisco that focuses on the culture and life and arts of, of the West. Um, we also are publishing weekly online book reviews and author interviews, and we are sponsoring the California Book Club. California Book Club is a, um, an online club. We do a book a month. Um, California books, uh, both contemporary and, um, and going back. And um, we have, this, as I said, this is our third. We will be continuing um, in next year in January with three more books. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, we're really committed to book coverage and literary coverage here at Alta um, as a significant um, factor in the way that we, we operate in the world. And as, um, at, you know, and we take it on faith that California is a center of literary production in the United States. Um, I want to just first thank our partners. Uh, we are partnering with a number of, of bookstores and libraries and, and cultural institutions, which include uh, Book Passage, Books Inc., Book Soup, Bookshop. Diesel, a bookstore, the Huntington USC Institute on California and the West, the Los Angeles Public Library, the San Francisco Public Library, Narrative Magazine, Roman's Bookstore, and Ziziva. We want to thank all our partners and hope that you will um, do business with them, um, subscribe to the publications, they are um, all well worth, your, uh, well worth your attention. And while I have your attention, I wanna discuss uh, briefly the bundle that you can get if you sign up um, as a uh, sign up for uh, the California Book Club, um, you will get uh, the three winter books, uh, which are uh, uh, Elaine Castillo's novel, America is Not the Heart, that book club uh, presentation will be January 21st, Paul Beatty's novel, The Sellout, that book club meeting will be on February 18th, and Nina Revoir's novel, Southland, uh, which we'll be discussing on March 18th. Um, you will also receive one year of Alta and this awesome tote bag, nicely made as a connoisseur of tote bags. I like a good thick canvas tote bag with a lot of pockets, and this has that. Uh, for a total of $75, makes a great gift makes a great gift for yourself, makes a great gift for others. Um, I'll be back at the end to sort of wrap things up, but for the moment, let me turn things over to John Freeman, who will be um, interviewing Walter Mosley. John, welcome, um, and welcome everyone. Hey, thank you, David, very much. It's uh, nice to be here, very nice to be here at the end of the year with uh, all 332 and counting of you who've uh, come here tonight to listen to us talk to Walter Mosley um, and a state lousy with crime writers from Kane and Chandler and Hammett and Grafton. Uh, I think the name Mosley will stand out um, for a very long time, um, even with this exciting new wave of Steph Cha and Ivy Pachota, because with Walter Mosley in this book, Devil in a Blue Dress, as David mentioned, first published in 1990, his first novel, California crime writing began to sound a lot more like it felt like to live in California. Um, the characters changed, the frame changed. This book begins with two black men in a bar and a white man comes in and interrupts them. Um, it's an exciting updating of the form. Um, it's a beautiful novel. It's full of sound and excellent uh, one-liners the way all good crime novels should be. Opens in 1948, easy Ezekiel Rollins, born in Louisiana sometime of Houston's Fifth Ward, but also Dallas, uh, has come home from World War II where he fought with distinction and has just recently lost his job um, at a machine plant um, where he's making uh, aircrafts. And he basically needs a job and he's offered one to look for uh, a white woman who's gone missing. And thus we begin this extraordinary novel as it fans out across the city and Walter shows us so much about Los Angeles in that time. Uh, over the next 20, 30 years, Walter wrote another 12 to 14 books about Easy Rollins. 
And if he had just done that, I think we would also be here um, because it's an extraordinary achievement, this series. Um, but there are two other series that Walter wrote. Um, he's also the author of some pretty extraordinary science fiction, political essays, literary fiction. He's a first rate short story writer. He's been in Best American Short Stories and he has a new collection out this year called Awkward Black Man. He is a brave and daring writer of what he calls sexistential novels, which is another way of saying erotica. Um, he's written plays. Uh, he's written books about how to write. Uh, he's a great uh, mentor to writers. And this year he's been honored by two Lifetime Achievement Awards, one from the Los Angeles Times Book Prize um, and another one just recently from the National Book Foundation. We could be here all night talking about what he's done already, but we're gonna talk about this book. So please join me in welcoming with a big uh, hands up or just woo woo from wherever you are, um, Walter Mosley. It's such a pleasure to have you, Walter. Hello. Hey. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, gr it's great doing it and being here in this uh, California twilight. I'm, uh, I'm very happy. I'm very happy. Thank you. That's a very yellow shirt. I'm. I'm Is it I'm, too yellow? It's, it's, no, it's great. Uh, it actually matches the painting behind you. Um, you know, I want to jump right in with uh, just a big question I've always had for you, which is, you know, this book came out in 1990. You were 38. I think you were, maybe were working in IT. You know, uh, when you started, did you think, I know, I'm going to write a crime series, or, or you know, you've written so many different types of novels. Why did you start with? Um, with with uh, with this series and, and how did it come to you? Um, that's that's a, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. I, I was writing and I really wanted to to be a novelist. It, it started off when I was thirty four. I started writing, and I'm, I'm and I'm thinking I want to be a novelist. I want to do something you know meaningful to me. And, and, and I had read when I, when I was, I think in my in 18, 19, 20, uh, a whole bunch of the Rogan Makar series of Emile Zola. And, and I thought, well, I'm gonna be writing a series of books about the different aspects of black life on the West Coast, it's a big, you know, America's a big country. I don't wanna take the whole place, but just the West Coast and uh, talk about that life. Um, and, and the first, first book I, I wrote was called Gone Fishing. Uh, which is easy and mouse uh, uh, going out to the swamps and doing all the stuff and and nobody wanted to publish it. I mean, and, the, and everybody said hey, you're a really good writer, but it's this is not a this is not a, a saleable book. This is you know it's not a commercial book, w which they meant at that time was and you know something that the people who are in charge of publishing believed. White people don't read about black people. Black people, uh, black women don't like black men, and 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 black men don't read. So who's going to read your book? But so, I, and that was okay. You know, you don't necessarily get your first book published. So I went to the next book and I started writing about Easy and Mouse again. This was, you know, that was kind of country. This is going to be in Los Angeles. So that was the difference for me. Um, about halfway through the book, I realized, well, this is a, a, a mystery. That, that's what this book is. Hmm. And so uh, it was, and, and that sold very easily because it seemed to be a great novelty that there was a black detective, which of course, it was not a novelty, but uh, I entered entered into the world, and so I entered into the world writing these books, which commercially they were wrong, but politically it's really interesting to get people who the, the how do you write a book that's not about your readers, but still get your readers to want to read it, and that is well, write a mystery, write a mystery about anything, and the the readers will come because. They like mysteries, and so the fact that it was in Black Los Angeles, the 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 fact that the fact it was a, a, a black a detective, it was like okay, great, let's see what that's like, and uh, and so you know I kept on doing that, but of course my interest in, in literature is larger than that, as you were saying, and so I you know I write a mystery and then I write something else, I write a mystery and then I write something else. So one of the things I've always loved about. Uh, these books is is you have those kind of one liners you know that you always get in a really good uh, noir card boiled type novel. Um, a man once told me that you step out of your door in the morning and you are already in trouble. The only question is, are you on top of it or not? Mm -hmm. Something like that. So you know th these all harken back to me to to some of the 
uh, masters of the form. And did you find when you were discovering your writing that these types of lines were already coming out? Or did you think, okay, this is a mystery. What are some of the notes I got to hit? Um, boy, that's a really hard question to answer. Um, and, 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 you know, and it, it seems like one kind of question, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, well, it's something else. Like writing for me, the words, the language, the sentences, the phrases, the, 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 the metaphors, all of that has to be interesting. It has to be something that excites you, you know, because you learn how to read when you're, you're a kid, right? And the, the kid is reading and going, oh my God, like, look, uh, you know, the way you're saying things, the way you're saying, you might even know that, but you're, but you're really being, you know, kind of uh, buoyed up and then, you know, just washed away by the language. I mean, it's just, it's cool. And, you know, my interest, you know, in language has always been poetry, I guess, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a thing that I didn't even know that in the beginning. Uh, and, and so the answer to your question is no, I, I, I wasn't trying to follow the convention. I, the basic conventions of any genre need to be followed, you know, like uh, in a mystery, well, there's a, a crime committed and there's somebody who's investigating the crime. Toward the end, we have to figure out who committed the crime. They may not pay for it. Uh, they may already be dead. Uh, they, they, you know, this might mean that they've, they've won, you know, the, the, the battle, whatever it is. Uh, you know, like that woman in, in uh, Sherlock Holmes. But uh, you need to know toward the end what happened. You know, mm -hmm. it's a question of knowledge. It's a question of awareness. And that awareness is about you and that awareness is about your world. I learned that along the way uh, to, to finishing Devil in a Blue Dress. But, um, but the way people you, use language and, 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 and how they sound, that's something, you know, very different. And... Mm -hmm. Uh, it's more about character than it is about genre. Right. You know? he, uh, Easy's got two voices. It's the one he speaks to us in. And then he's got that voice in his head. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk to me a little bit about that voice, because that voice is something he relies on. Uh, but it, it doesn't come in, until uh, you know, midway through the novel when you realize that he's got this other voice that tells him things that, that, that helps him stay safe, really. Yeah, again, a, a very difficult moment. I think that, that Easy's voice has changed over the years. But for me, that was an, an aspect of Black consciousness that uh, we're so isolated, we're so alone in this um, genre, which is among other things existential. Um, we need help. And sometimes that help is not, it's not coming from any external like uh, source. And it's an internal thing. It's the, it's the way that we convince ourselves to keep on trying to survive. It's not necessarily going to survive, but that's, a, it's a, it's a real, it's a survival uh, mode more, more than a technique. It's a survival mode freeze. When, when he gets to that place that's, you know, so hard, which, you know, most people in their lives never get to. He, he needs something else to help him, to help him through. And that's, that's, that's where I came up with this voice. And of course, when I say I came up with it, it's not like I, tr I figured that out. It's just that voice started talking to Easy and I, mm -hmm. and I had to deal with it as, as, as a writer. Yeah. Hmm. So why, why did you set this in 1940s to 1960 Los Angeles? I mean, you could you have a vast and kind of t tentacular intellect. You could have gone to any part of the, the city's past, but why, the, why those two decades? 1945, uh, let's say 39 to 45, um, World War II was, was a moment of great, great transformation for black people in America. A whole lot of black men went to war some black women, but mostly black men went to war uh, in Europe, uh, in Asia, and uh, learned something about themselves in relationship to the world that was mostly kept a secret. 
from you in America, in in the in the in the theater houses, in in the libraries, uh, in the in the in the court systems, uh, at work, uh, you you couldn't uh, you couldn't get anywhere. The one of the guys who 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 synthesized uh, the birth control pill. Um, went to Harvard, I, I forgot his name, but he went to Harvard in, in the late 30s, or not uh, mid 30s. Uh, but Harvard told him, you can go to school here as a chemist, but you, you will never, you will never be, get a, doct a PhD from Harvard. He went to Vienna. Now, Vienna, Vienna is like the, the, the center of racism, you know, at that time. But they said, oh, you're really smart. Why don't you get a PhD here? It, 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 this, this was a world where when after the World War II was over, uh, people from Mississippi and the Central South moved to, to, to uh, Chicago and thereabouts, uh, Detroit. Uh, it, from the East, they moved up to New York. And from the West, Texas and Louisiana, they moved up to California, Southern California. I mean, people moved to other places, but that was it. That was an extraordinary migration. If you want respect, uh, if you want freedom, and most importantly, if you want a job, you had to leave the Old South. And people who, they, they'd already been to war. So, you know, packing up in, in Dallas and moving, you know, to the East Bay was not much of a problem. And millions of people did it. And that was the beginning of, of a change. And so I was writing about that change. Hmm. Your father was a veteran. Um, did, did he talk about going to war? Did you, did you have family members or people that lived around you growing up that, that talked about it? You know, he did. Everybody, every, almost every uh, black male in my father's family and extended family had been to war, almost all of them. Um, one of the stories that my father used to tell is that he lived in Fifth Ward, Houston, Texas. He, he would tell me, he said, well, you know, the, on Friday night, the police would leave Fifth Ward. And on Sunday morning, they come back in to count the bodies because nobody, nobody was safe there. You know, I, I don't know how many crazy people could live in Fifth Ward. My father left Fifth Ward uh, with about 100 guys, went to war. Uh, about 90 of those guys made it back. Very few of them died in combat. And... Uh, almost everybody he was friendly with in Fifth Ward before he left, they were dead. Mm. That was, so there were stories, but the stories weren't exactly, you know, like, you know, your regular Irish family or, you know, any uh, so-called white family. Um, you know, you went to war and it was a terrible thing. It was really awful. And da, da, da. My father, there was a lot of good to it for him. His life increased. His sense of uh, self-respect increased. His safety level increased by being in World War II. It's interesting in the novel, um, Easy's experience in war makes it harder for him to go back to uh, working in this plant, uh, this factory where he's working on airplanes and to take some of the abuse that he's expected to take. You have this quote, a job in a factory is an awful lot like working on a plantation in the South. The bosses all see the workers like their children and everyone knows how lazy children are. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the reasons he loses his job is he says, look, I'm, I, I've, I've been to war. I can stand on my own two feet. You just show me some respect. And that's not an option. And I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how Easy's experience in war uh, affects him as a, as a character and as a as a detective too. Well, I think as, as, as my, my character, Easy, uh, it was a little unusual in, in, uh, in the most black men and women's experience in, in World War II. Easy uh, fought in, in big battles. He, he fought in really big battles and, and, and he uh, had learned, as he says in the beginning of Devil in a Blue Dress, uh, I had killed enough white men to realize that they were just as afraid to die as I was. He had, he had in a very uh, violent and almost negative sense, learned what equality meant. And he put his life on the line. He killed people, which is the second worst thing to just dying itself in war if you're a sensitive person. 
he had killed people in this war. And now you're going to come back, you know, after spilling blood, after after losing his innocence in a way, and you're going to have some, you know, some pot belly dude come up to him and say, well, you know, let me explain to you what's what, when he already knows what's what. He goes, I know it. And I, I went out there and I, I put my life on the line for this. And now, and you're, now you're going to tell me that, that I have to say, yes, boss, of course you're right, even though I know you're a fool, you know? And he couldn't, he couldn't do that. Uh, and many of his friends couldn't. Uh, and, that, and this is a very modern take, you know, because there are a lot of people who, they just did their job. They went to work every day. But uh, Easy, Mouse, Jackson Blue, uh, a lot of a lot of these these characters said, "Look, it's it, 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 it's my way or nothing, you know. I'm 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 I'd rather fail doing it myself than succeed, you know, bowing and scraping to you." Hmm. Do you th the the man I described earlier, if you haven't read the book yet, who comes into the bar, uh, Joppy's bar, um, where they're hanging out in the first scene, and they do throughout the book is named Albright and he's a kind of fixer who comes to find uh, this woman Daphne Monet who's gone missing and she's the mistress of a wealthy white woman named Carter and do you think that Albright knows that that what you just described in, in Easy is one of his strengths that his fearlessness comes from an experience that is uh you know that that's not containable and also um it, it comes from war I think DeWitt, DeWitt Albright understands easy. But the problem for anybody when they, they've uh, perverted their own concept of history, which America has so completely, you know, with, with Native Americans, uh, A Asians, uh, Blacks, Hispanics, women, you know, it's just like, you know, uh, there's so many ways that American history has left out the pillars of American history. So Dewitt Albright under, understands easy. He just doesn't understand himself in relation to easy. And because he doesn't do that, he's bound to fail. But it's hard to tell that, you know. But the, the idea is that, that this white man and understands easy pretty well, but he doesn't understand himself in relation to ease. That seems to be a thing that re recurs throughout the book. When he sits down with Carter, easy reflects. He says, look at us, we're two men talking and Carter's revealing emotional attachments to this woman, Daphne Monet. And the reason he can do that is, is not because we are the same, it's because he doesn't acknowledge me mm -hmm. as uh, of equal personage. And I, I wonder if you can talk about that uh, complexity of um, interaction. It, 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 it unfolds even further when um, Easy has a kind of erotic relationship with Daphne Monet, who reads as white at first, and he has to question whether his, uh, his, attra his attachment to her, her attra his attraction to her is based on her whiteness. But can you talk about these complexities in the novel and, and what that did maybe for the challenges of making it into a film. One of the things I, I really wanted to talk about was the complexities of black life. And even as, as, as short as the 30 years ago when I started, a lot of that had not reached the, the, the surface of, of, of consciousness in America, period. Certainly not in our library, certainly not in our schools, certainly not uh, in, in, in our, uh, you know, uh, enjoyments, our, our novels, our movies. Uh, but it's so complex, you know. I mean, you know, Black people would always say, well, you know, uh, white people understand themselves pretty well, but they don't know it as well as we do because their lives aren't on the line in order to understand that. So my, my life is on the line to understand that white man over there. I got to understand him. I have to know what he's doing, what he's thinking, what she's doing, what she's thinking. And even in myself, even the complex identity of, of Daphne and Monet is so much more complex than most people who just, you know, wake up in the morning and they are themselves. I mean, but it's it's like, oh, and a, a lot of it is like, uh, you know, when, when I got the, you know, the, the medal for the National Book Award, you know, just, you know, a few weeks ago, um, it wasn't a simple thing. Like, I'm going to get up there and say, well, um, 
I'd like to thank my mother and my father and my dog who was always with me. You know, I want to thank me and my children or whatever. Uh, the fact is I was the first black man ever uh, to get this award. And there's some people, you know, uh, uh, Amiri Baraka, uh, Ishmael Reed, Ralph Ellison, um, Iceberg Slim, by the by, you know, me, me writing the first black detective is silly. Um, and I have to like know all of that and also bring all of that into the, into the discussion in order to allow most people who, ha who know, have no knowledge of this to say, mm -hmm. oh, right, uh, this, is, this is a momentous occasion, not necessarily for him, but for, you know, a, a people. I mean, and you know, I like having those kind of conversations. Most Black people like having those kind of conversations because they're important for us to understand our survival. Hmm. I hope I answered your question with that. I think I did. Yeah, uh, you absolutely did. Um, I, I, I'm sort of trying to move us towards thinking a little bit about the movie briefly because we have as a guest someone who um, in a very much long ago previous life uh, worked on the set of the film. And just to set us up here, I, I wonder if you can talk about the, the challenges of representation and, and fiction and what that means and the challenges of representation in a, in a, in a film because and I wonder, I guess, if you could assess if that's possible in 1992 or whenever the film came out, how, how the films were doing versus novels in terms of catching up with how life was actually lived. You know, and, and so, so are we talking more about, we're talking about film now, right? I mean, yes. a little bit. You know, the other night I rewatched uh, uh, what I think is a great American film, Sweet, 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 sweet back's badass song, right? Was it late, late 60s, 68, 69, something like that. Melvin Van Peebles made this extraordinary film. And I, and I watched it the other night and it was like I watched it for the first time ever. Because as, as long as you were looking at it, like, uh, like let's say, let's say you're looking at it and say, well, this is a race film. It's a, it's a film about these black people, these uh, uh, criminal, uh, uh, crazy, oversexed, whatever, black people. And it's not. It's, it's a surrealist film. Melvin, who made his first movie, learned how to make film in France, was making a film that was telling a truth and then laying upon that another truth and another and another. Uh, so you could do it. You can make a film that's gonna be absolutely who you are, what you are, where you are. And magically, most people around you won't see it hmm. because they've been trained not to think of you in any uh, uh, complex aesthetic uh, or, or psychological way. Hmm. Uh, and it's just, and I was really, I learned something about myself because you know we're all victims of racism in America and we're all racists in America. And so, um, we, we have to kind of, I'm looking at that and said, wow, I watched this film before and I loved it, but I was blind. I didn't see what this film was, you know, there, and there are, you know, great thinkers, you know, who, who, if, if you just sit down and, and say what you see, say what you experienced, say in this situation, what somebody else would experience, if you just do that, you're going to catch that human's life because, mm -hmm. you know, that's what it is. It's about human lives. Hmm. Well, I'm going to bring on um, our guest at this point, uh, who uh, we know now as an author of more than almost two dozen books for adults and children, uh, for Breath, Eyes, Memory, her debut novel, which was an Oprah selection choice to Crick Crack, her first collection of stories, which were finalists for the National Book Award, to uh, many, many books for children, um, The Dew Breaker, which won the National Book Critics Circle. Uh, as well as her most recent novel, uh, book, Everything Inside, um, a collection of stories which won the Story Prize. Uh, she's also won a MacArthur Genius Grant. Um, but back in 1992, 91, um, she was recently just out of Bard College. Uh, and so one of her jobs was to work on the set of 
Devil in a Blue Dress. Uh, please join me in welcoming Edwige Dandika. Mm -hmm. Hello. Edwige. Can you see me? <laughs> yes. Hi, hi everybody. Hi, Walter. Hi, John. Well, I don't hi, want me. to, <laughs> actually this is a kind of full circle moment in the sense that when um, Walter received his medal, um, I got the honor of presenting uh, it to him virtually as we're doing now. But actually I, I met Walter through film and Easy Rollins through film. I was working for Jonathan Demi and they had optioned uh, Devil in a Blue Dress for the great wonderful director Carl Franklin. And so I read the book working um, in the office and there was so much, you know, there's so much power to it, the one-liners you mentioned, but in a way that it's like such a, an extraordinary coming of age story that then we get to live with Walter and with Easy Rollins over the decades from Devil in a Blue Dress to Little Scarlet. And, and we watch, we watch um, Easy and Mouse and everybody grow and go through their trouble. And that way I, it, was, it was a genre breaking book. And then Walter went back with uh, Gone Fishing um, and I think in the way that Walter's project with Easy and a lot of his other books, but particularly with Easy, is similar to what, you know, to um, August Wilson's project, I think, with Fences and that we travel, you know, through this uh, more uh, great African-American experience of African-American males, in his case, through, through, through this um, experience. So when I, I, I don't want to overstate my work on the set, we, I worked in the office and I actually worked when I met Walter, when he came to the office, when they were talking about, about the book and, and I got to go on set with um, one of the producers, Diana Choi for a couple of days and, and they were shooting in the hills of Los Angeles and it was just stunning. And I think this film, and I think Walter, you might've been hinting at that, that made, maybe not many people saw it, but it's a very, it's a wonderful film. It's a, it's literary, you know, um, in the way that the book is as well. It's, it's just a scrumptious um, film. But I wanted to ask you, Walter, um, to transition us back to, I remember when people would ask Walter about his, what, like, what does he think about the, the films have done to his book? It's like, my book is still right there on the shelf. <laughs> so yeah. like, I, I've always kind of borrowed that, like this idea that the film doesn't change the, the, the book. But I think this film is certainly a, a wonderful uh, complement to supplement to to the book. I, I was always curious. I don't think I've ever asked you about your use of colors in in these books. Like, how did that come about, <laughs> and <laughs> how did you make that decision? Well, you know the. I think there's a a, a couple of things. Um, you know, a, a couple of answers. Uh, to those questions. Number one, uh, I love film. You know, uh, I'm I'm out in LA now working on you know on television and uh, and you know more kind of streaming uh, kind of things and it's, it's it's lots of fun. But you know, I I've never felt uh, and so far I don't think it has been. Film has been on the whole as deep as, as literature that when you read a book that is yours and in a way you create that book because you're, you're using this like you're using a language to to transform in, in into a three-dimensional world and also a, a world of consciousness uh that's your business uh but as far as the 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 colors are concerned you know i i wrote a, a devil in a blue dress and in a lot of ways um the the novel was was informed uh, by you know by popular music and jazz, it, it's sensibilities, not not anything else, just the sensibilities, and um, and so you know I you know just kind of like mutated uh, a song, you know, and, and, and created the title uh, "Devil in a Blue Dress," and then I wrote the next book, and and I I was thinking, well, you know, th that's interesting. I'm gonna you know, I'm talking about communism a little bit. And I, I'm going to call this book, uh, you know, uh, a red death. You know, and and it's um, also, you know, thinking about another, you know, genre and uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, the first real detective writer, uh, had had a book, you know, uh, Mask of the Red Death, 
uh, use that. And so then it, it came around to the third book and I was thinking about the, the title and, and my editor said to me, uh, Walter, what, what's the color? And, and I didn't actually think about colors. I hadn't thought about them. And I, and I went there and said, well, what do you mean, Jerry? Uh, and he goes, well, you know, there's a color, you know, this is, you, you got, uh, you know, blue and red. What's, what's the next color? And uh, I went, oh, okay. And I just been writing colors for titles ever since. <laughs> Walter, I'm gonna um, come back in here uh, and, and on the back of Edwidge's question. Um, you know, one of the big debuts of that film was Don Cheadle as Mouse. Uh, yeah. Literally stole the film in many ways. And I wonder if you could talk to us, one of the questions from the audience is about Mouse. You know, some people, women find him sexy. Others think he's just plain evil. What did you have in mind uh, for him as a character? That, I, you know, the, the, when, by the time I got to that third book, uh, or maybe the fourth, uh, Black Betty, I, I understood that I was writing about Black male heroes. And there's all kinds of Black male heroes. You know, it's not just the, the heroes that the, the society is going to take. It's like Robin Hood, you know, in his day was not a hero. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. I'm, I'm blank on my screen, but it doesn't really matter. If you can hear me, that's great. Um, the uh, you know the the, the I, had, I had I had oh my god I, I I got I got lost in there but mouse is is the way I explain mouse the way I think of mouse is that uh, easy is the hero of these novels because he's it's from his point of view but mouse is the hero of easy's world because. Uh, He's the person who's brave enough to stand up for himself, no matter what. Mm. Someone says, everyone knows a mouse in the hood, the one who's fearless. Say, are you, when you say fearless, you're talking about my, my character fearless or something else? Or that, that... No, no, everyone uh, said, everyone knows a mouse in the hood, someone who is fearless. Yeah, everybody knows him uh, and everybody's afraid of him. But they're more they're, they're more excited that he exists than uh, that they're afraid. Mm. One of the things I love about Easy is just uh, you, you write into his vulnerabilities in very subtle ways. Um, and so there are moments, you know, when he is getting together with Daphne, for example, um, he's she's speaking adjectivally about things that she would like him to do. And he's a, he's a bit overwhelmed. Um, and he feels like she's taken on a masculine role in their uh, lovemaking. And you're constantly looking at uh, how Easy feels vis-a-vis -vis his gender and his masculinity in ways that uh, it's, it's not just, um, there's a question that came from the audience about this before the, the event saying that, you know, this is not just unusual in, in crime writing, this is just unusual in, in writing in general. Um, that, that Easy reflects on his blackness in those moments and his damage. Um, and normally this writer, the question, the person who asked the question says, you have to go to the treatises of Coates, Baldwin and Wilkerson for that kind of analysis. Hmm. Um, why, you know, why did you decide that th that sort of belonged in the story, that kind of self-reflection? If you're in charge, if, if, if you're the, the boss, if you're the, the cop, you're the person with the gun, you're the person with the courts, you're the you're the person with the gang, uh, you know, e e you know, either uh, legal or illegal, then the way that you begin to think about things is you're just going to come in and, and be the hero. You're going to make this happen. Nobody's going to stand up to you. Nobody can stand up to you. But if, if, if you come, you know, from any of the, you know, so-called minorities in America, then you know that your vulnerability is in his pocket. That you have to understand your where you're weak in order to make make it through you know the finish line you have to 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 understand um what it's like you know to to have somebody on your side uh uh Edna Mae Harris for instance 
you have to be able to sidestep the brunt uh, of the, the, the arrogant force that, that runs your world and keeps you out of running your world. So, I mean, it, 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 it's obvious that uh, easy, easy is vulnerable and that's, you know, that's a, you know, it's not a, a common trait. I mean, it's one of the many, uh, a common trait, um, but he uses that for success because you have to use everything that comprises you for success. Hmm. There's a question um, from Ron Blake. Uh, in TV, generally the protagonist is given depth in, uh, in the series. Um, uh, you were able to give depth to Easy Mouse and even the bar owner, um, Joppy was the bar owner's name. You could see many layers of them, all of them in one book, um, one goddamn good book. Um, <laughs> he says, and I wonder, you know, the, the, the genre writing is, um, I think, broadly uh, often uses broad characterizations. And it doesn't feel like in your, in this series, especially, um, but in your books in general, that you, you ever, you, you, you ever do that very much. You know, it seems like everyone gets a kind of moment for uh, complexity. And I wonder if that's a kind of Hippocratic Mosley oath, or is that, <laughs> um, what, what is that decision? I like character development. I think that it's a big part of, you know, uh, you know, all of the theater arts, you know, from novels to movies to radio plays. I mean, you, you know, you, you have to, you, you have to have character development. And The, the the old existentialist the old detective existentialist novels the great ones you know by you know uh, the Maltese Falcon uh, the High Window uh, um, you know the you know Ross McDonald's you know wonderful works um, take a a classic existentialist hero who has no uh, money, no house, no car, no friend, no parents, no children, and allows that person to make decisions. You know, like uh, 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 Marceau and and, and um, uh, the stranger Camus character. And in a way, that makes it easy. If I have no connection in the world then I can do what I want. Please say, I'm going to throw you in prison for 12 years. You'll go to prison because you stand up for what you believe. Now, if you have a child at home, you can't do that. If you have a friend that, that you love that needs you, you can't do that. If you have a dog that needs to be fed that night and walked, you can't do that. And it makes being an existentialist hero infinitely more uh, complex and I think interesting. Hmm. So to 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 put a a regular guy in a detective's shoes, um, which I'm sure most real detectives are, uh, you've taken a step forward uh, in the genre. You know, and this isn't saying nothing bad about the early guys because they were great. You know, but I, I think that you know the genre. You know, if it's go if it's going to you know survive, has to become more complex you know, with the intellectual, you know, appreciation of self and culture. There, there's a comment I'd like to go back to um, uh, because one of the questions had to do with writing Easy's sort of network of family, um, which is one of the, what one of the commenters really loved about these books is that you sort of slowly get braided into Easy's um, extended family network. And I, I wonder though, if, if um, you can talk a little bit about uh, Easy's erotic relationships. I mean, there's at least two in this book. Um, they're beautifully described, uh, but they're they're quite. Um, uh, let's just say the women are in charge of both, um, mostly. Um, he kind of walks away, thinking what just happened. Um, and you've gone on to write other two other books of erotica, at least that I know of. Um, maybe you're writing under a third name. I would not. That would not surprise me. <laughs> um, and, and if I'm correct, both of those are from uh, a wom woman's perspective. Uh, well, one is. One, one is, John, John Woman is, right? 
Yeah. Uh, well, no, John Woman is is not really you know erotic. He's kind of you know a sociopath and talks about this sociopathy. Uh, uh, but but Debbie doesn't do it anymore. It's yes. certainly fr from a woman woman's point of, of view. Uh, and uh, killing Johnny Fry is from the the guy's point of view. But I think in, in many ways he, he's very vulnerable. You know, I mean, you know, uh, Aristotle starts it off by saying, you know, theater. You know, in order to have theater that works, you need the dialectic. You know, you need you need both sides playing, and you know it's not so much that the women are in charge; it's just that they're part of the di they're part of the dialogue, and which means uh, there has to be an ebb and flow for the male character. And you know, this, this is one, you know the only thing kind of in any way uh, original, you know, in 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 uh, male heterosexual uh, erotica that uh, the you know the guy in, in Killing Johnny Fry was actually looking for meaning in his life and uh, and dealing with really powerful characters, you know, that, that gave him sex, of course, but they also gave him meaning. And I think that if, if you're not learning, if you're not getting from here to there in, in any book, uh, then you're not taking advantage of uh, everything that, that, that you could. I have a new, you know, Easy Rollins novel coming out in, in February, Blood Grove. And Blood Grove is when he realizes that, you know, it's not just a black and white world. It's, it is a black and white world, but it's all these other things. And he, he has an identity with veterans, with anybody who's ever experienced war, that they have things in common that they don't have in common with other people. You know, and, and that's, you know, it's like being black. It's like, you know, being a man, being a woman, you know, uh, you know, being a Serb, you know, whatever you are, you know, what does that put you in common with other people? And, you know, it was really fun to, to discover how, how easy, you know, is working with this young white guy and his problems because they're both veterans, you know, and they were both, you know, whopped upside the head by war. Yeah, do you, um, he, at one point he drinks a, a, a fifth of vodka with some grapefruit soda yeah. uh, and walks out the door like he's he hasn't missed a step. <laughs> and and I, 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 rereading it this time through, I thought, wow, he uh, easy's putting away a lot of liquor. And it, it made me wonder if you thought of him from the beginning. I mean, I know some, some of that's the convention of the genre, but if you thought of him from the beginning as, as a little bit traumatized by war. No, he's definitely traumatized. But I mean, he's also traumatized by being black. I mean, you know, and then he's also traumatized by being black in war. <laughs> it's, you know, there's a there's a there's a lot of uh, uh, trauma uh, in, in the lives of of uh, black folk uh, that have to be you know that has to be you know responded to uh, daily. You know, Easy thinks that he got his his detective training when he was just nine, 10, 11 years old. In, in Texas, he said, because he would never go in a door that he didn't come to and study before, you know, for a little while before, before passing through, because you have to be ready for anything on the other side. Most people, you know, they're not feeling like that. They say, well, I walk in the door and everything will be fine, you know, because I'm a good person, the world's a good world, uh, I'm protected. And, you know, and now, of course, slowly we're realizing in America that we're not that. Slowly, I think even today in, 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 in the politics of America, uh, where we, 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 we realize that we are being, uh, limited by, uh, the forces that be, you know, I, I, you know, my friend Katrina Vanden Heuvel at the nation, you know, always tells me I, I shouldn't say the next thing is, but, I, you know, I go, yeah, we're, we're, we're limited, uh, by the machinations of capitalism, uh, Used to be, um, black people were were had our nose right up against that wall. But now everybody in America does. And one day, very soon, everybody's going to realize that they're on the same side, and they they have to make decisions based on their own needs, not the fallacious needs of a world that says that they're middle class when they're not. Mm. There's so much in this book about work, um, but I want to go back to something that you were just. Uh, saying about Easy because there's a question from one of the um, listeners about Easy and his relationship with the LAPD. Uh, he gets picked up once, at least uh, early on in this book. Um, 
and he kn he knows exactly what's going to happen with the interaction. Um, and I wonder if you can talk about what he thinks of the the, the police department because um, he isn't he, he's also an unlicensed uh, um, private detective at least at the beginning of this series. Yeah. Uh, the police are not necessarily uh, to a man evil, but they are and see themselves as Easy's enemy. Hmm. And Easy understands that. Easy, you know, uh, you know, in my new book, at one point, Easy says, you know, I have spent enough time uh, being stopped, uh, questioned, uh, jailed, uh, uh, interrogated uh, by police and other representatives of, of the greater culture that I can make me a 12 year old child filled with, with spite and bitterness. Um, you know, if, if you're in a car uh, driving to West Los Angeles and you're a black man, there's a black woman sitting next to you or vice versa, uh, the police are gonna stop you and they're gonna assume you're doing something wrong. You, in their heart, you are doing something wrong just by being in this car, but also that makes you a criminal. Whatever you do, however you express yourself, wherever you go, if you're not, if it's not, you know, like right in, in front of your own house, you're going to be in trouble. And the police bring you that trouble. So anybody who, every time you see them, are bringing you trouble, uh, that's your enemy. Hmm. I want to bring Ed Weech back in. Um, Ed Weech, you know, uh, you, you complimented Carl Franklin on his directing of this film. Uh, I wonder, you know, this film came out right, right around the Los Angeles uprising around the Rodney King um, beating. I wonder if you can, if you could reset the context of what it meant to have this film coming out when it did and saying some of the things it did about, um, you know, being black in Los Angeles in the time. Well, I think, um in many ways that was in the minds of, uh, you know, at least the production team um, where I was working is that in, in a way to have a, a kind of um, reclaiming of Los Angeles, right? The rerouting uh, that this character would represent. And, um, and the fact that it was certainly, you know, the lead was Denzel Washington who uh, helped a lot and, and then Jennifer Beals and the complexity, just as what you were saying about the complexities of black lives and, and a kind of, I mean, it was set in the past, but it, um, it felt so, it felt so present because you could go to, you know, uh, on the set in certain settings, uh, you didn't have to change much in terms of, you know, just the way that in the book that the palm trees are described and, and you just pull down the street and you can, you can imagine this time of, of um, just, you know, ordinary folks trying to have an ordinary life. But as Walter was saying, like the, you know, these greater forces won't allow them to. But I, I think it was also important in all the discussions that I was privy to, to make also a really beautiful film. And then it's like the film to have a beautiful landscape in the way that you could um, you could see in the book in some of the in some of the you know the descriptions. I think I think beauty was was very important. That this contrast with with the with the beauty and and ugliness, which um, personally made me um, curious. You know, I think we were there's that the, the Los Angeles setting and the book in the setting, which um, I think made people very eager. Um, and I'd love to hear Walter talk about that, about the prequel um, and the whole, like you call it a prequel, but I, that you said, Walter, that it was the first book, Gone Fishing, uh, because that book sort of set up this whole theme that's in the book of the Great Migration, of easy sort of being part of the Great Migration. So I'd love, I mean, if, um, if there's time, if Walter could, I would love to hear some, like you talk about the prequel and, and also your relationship with Paul Coates and, and how that played out through the, the publishing of that book, Gone Fishing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, well, you know, Paul Coates, he's, he's, uh, He's, he's one of those, you know, uh, 
great unknown heroes of America. I mean, I guess it's not unknown because Ta-Nehisi Coates is his son, but uh, you know, he, he did so much work, you know, in, when he was in the Panthers, uh, when he started publishing books, distributing books, um, you know, he's, he's, he's a, a great, a great man. And, and, you know, uh, I, I, you know, talked about, uh, you know, I did devil and I think the devil really was a kind of, um, uh, the Mardi Gras uh, of South central LA back in the day where, you know, there's, you know, lots of good and lots of bad is going on, but at least, at least, you know, you're alive. Uh, and, and then earlier I wrote gone fishing, which, you know, was not a detective, but much more a coming of age novel of two, you know, uh, you know, young 18, 19 year old uh, black men in, in, in Southern Texas and also this uh, mythical town of Pariah, Texas. Um, and I, I'd written that book and nobody wanted to publish that book as I said before. And then I, I you know, the devil in a blue dress, people were very excited and I'm, I'm writing these mysteries. But my publisher at the time, W.W. Norton, they, they were not interested in publishing uh, 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 gone fishing. And, you know, they almost convinced me that it wasn't any good uh, until, you know, I, I, I came to, you know, uh, the, 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 the person uh, uh, I was working with for, you know, things other than the mysteries, uh, uh, Nicole Araji at, um, at Watkins Loomis Agency. And, and I gave her the book and she said, well, this is a really good book. Why don't we publish, publish this book, you know? And I thought, well, that's great. You know, but you know, my the publisher doesn't want to do it, and and uh, and then I, again, another you know person enters my life. I I, I go to a speech, and it's Max Rodriguez. And Max Rodriguez says, "Well, listen, you're black. If you're successful, she wants a whole, whole audience. Because you're black. If if you're successful, you're doing well. Every once in a while, I'll give a book to a black publisher, um, and that will that will help you and your people, and also you know." Uh, raise everybody up. And so I, I went to Paul Coates. I, I found out who he was. I didn't know him then. I, I went to him. I said, hey, listen, Paul, you want to publish this book? And he said, great, let's do it. And, and we had this kind of wonderful experience of, you know, of, of a book about, you know, it's not city easy. It's, it's rural easy. And it, 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 it's not, you know, uh, an easy who has this, you know, kind of multi-leveled understanding of his life, but an, an easy, just a young a black man who, you know, who believes, you know, like my father believes. He, the, 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 that man believed, my father told me, he said, he, when he went to World War II, um, he was, uh, he, he had this belief. He said, well, this is a war between America and Germany. And, you know, and you say, well, yeah, it was. What are you, what are you saying about that? And, and he goes, well, you know, I'm not an American, you know, I, I'm just, I'm just a Negro from, you know, from Texas. And it wasn't until the Germans started shooting at him that he realized, oh God, they think I'm an American. You know, th this is that transition from gone fishing uh, to, to devil in a blue dress. Oh God, I'm an American. You know, I, I got to do something, you know, I, you know, I just can't, you know, I can't hide in the corners uh, for the ramifications of, you know, what, what these, you know, many crazy people are doing. We're um, getting towards the end of this hour, which is flying by. I would love to spend several hours with you. Walter is a great company and he will make you do many things. I once bought a TV with my girlfriend, because I ran into Walter and he said, you have to buy this particular TV. Um, and that is just the beginning of things that Walter Mosley can make you do. Uh, <laughs> but one thing that Walter really does make you do is uh, write. Uh, he's written um, two books about writing, which are excellent. I highly recommend them as a writer and as a teacher of writing. And I, I guess, Walter, I want to ask you a, a question. Um, if you could go back and give 38 year old Walter some advice about writing his first book his first what would it be um, particularly for writing your first mystery is there anything that that you kind of learned on the job um, in doing it those first couple books where you think wow I wish someone had just told me this straight out okay I'm gonna answer that question I, I, I do want to say thank you so much for doing this today John you know I mean I, I really do appreciate it uh, it's, it's really wonderful and, and I love the way you think you know, and uh, yeah, I do. Um, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm such a Californian that 
I approach things uh, as, as, just as if everything is possible. It's, it's possible. It's not like I think everything is possible. I just approach everything as if it was possible. And, you know, it's kind of like when, when, when the, somebody once said to, to Sugar Ray Robinson uh, when he was old and, and broke, they said, I bet you wish you, uh, you lived a different life now. I bet you wish everything was different. And, and Sugar Ray Robinson said, man, if I got to live my life over again, I would do everything exactly the way I did it. He said, because that was a great life. And, you know, I kind of feel like that, you know. I mean, if, 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 if somebody was to ask me uh, what they should do what I, I think people should do about you know being coming a writer you know I would I have opinions about that but if 38 year old Walter Mosley was asking me I would say hey man you seem to be doing all right you know you know <laughs> just keep on doing that you know and it'd be good because you know I write every day so you know and that's like you know 86 percent of being a writer is writing every day and I do that and so you know the other 14 percent well you can you know Play it out the way you want. One final question, um, which people are dying to know. Uh, you know, Walter, as you can tell from the number of books he's published and the, and the range of books he's published, is a restless uh, intellect. Um, he's also a restless uh, creator. I once ran into you on the street, and uh, and you had just gotten a BlackBerry, and you'd written a, a novel on your on your BlackBerry. Yeah, uh, that was killing at... Johnny Fry. I was doing that. As... <laughs> And, right. and then you and then you said in that conversation, but I've done this before. I wrote one on my Palm Pilot um, ages ago, and I thought, okay, this uh, like pretty soon there's going to be the Walter Mosley iPad novel. Um, but <laughs> behind you, there's a lot of paint, and so everyone wants to know: are you are you going to be spending you know the, the the next part of your life painting, or have you already started, or is that just um, a backdrop? Well, it is a backdrop because it's behind me, but, <laughs> uh, you know, I started drawing when I was 12. I'm not very good at it. I'm really not. But, you know, like, like for instance, I'm, you know, like I, I work on things like I, I have this, I, I'm, I'm doing this drawing right now. This is, but I, I do drawings every day and I've, and I've drawn my entire life since I was 12 years old. I love it. I, I'm still not very good at it, but I have developed a voice inside of it. And so drawing has always been a part of my life. It, it seems much more an internal part than this, you know, the, the, the writing, which is very, you know, external, very much in the world. But, uh, but I, I love, you know, I love all the forms of expression because, you know, that's how, that's how we deal with each other in the world with all of these things, you know, you, you know through music, uh, uh, through through uh, you know uh, um, you know uh, you know plastic art through 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 writing um, through you know philosophy thinking I mean I, it, it's it's just it's just a wonderful thing I've done I've run, I've I've drawn longer than I've done any other thing and there's always been that kind of backdrop in my life. Well, I hope there's a curator watching because I, I, I um, it looks actually pretty amazing. Uh, at this point, I, you know, we're, we're a little bit past time and I, I know some people might have to get on and make, make dinner or drive home or uh, go walk a dog that's standing at the door or take Long. care of someone. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, uh, sadly, uh, not because it's him, but um, end this part of our conversation and bring David Eulen, um back to, to sort of walk us out the door. Walter, it was great to see you. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Um, loved rereading re this book and so excited that there's a, a new one coming um, in 21. That's, that's great news. Well, thank you, John. It's, it's, it really has been wonderful. It's, it's great to do this.
Thanks, John. Um, and thank you, Walter. This was, that was a phenomenal conversation. I'm really, um, there's so much to digest and think about. Um, I want to thank, um, so I want to, so again, thank you very much to John and to Walter. I'd like to thank um, Edwige Danticat for being here um, as well. The interview will be archived, will be available at californiabookclub.com if you want to watch it again. I know I certainly will be. Um, a couple of points before we break. Um, next week's Next week, well, next week, there is no book. Next month's book is America is Not the Heart by Elaine Castillo. That, um, that book club meeting will be on Thursday, January 21st at 5 p.m. Um, I'd like to remind you again about the bundle, $75 for the three winter books. Elaine Castillo's America is Not the Heart, Paul Beatty's The Sellout, and Nina Revoir's Southland, along with a year's subscription to Alta and the, um, the excellent tote bag. Um, and I want to um, ask you all to please stick around for a couple minutes to do a two-minute two survey that will pop up as soon as we end the event. Um, and more than anything, um, I want to urge everybody to stay home, read books, stay safe, see you next year, and have very happy holidays. Happy New Year, and thank you all for being here.